بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف خلق الله المرسلين سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا الصلاة تبارك تعالى في هذه الليلة وفي الوقت المتبقي until the end of the, the journal club tonight أصلى الله سبحانه وتعالى أن يعني ينفع بما قدم الليلة وأن يجعله يا رب في موزين حسنات لكل القائمين عليهم على رأسهم دكتور حسن ودكتور المغلاء and my colleague who presented uh, uh, the previous presentation. Uh, actually, I'm, I'm very delighted and I have the great honor tonight uh, to be with you. Uh, and I'm very thankful to my professor, uh, Dr. Hassan uh, Khaled for uh, giving me the opportunity tonight uh, to be with you. فجزا الله كل خير وربنا يديه الصحة والعافية ويبارك فيه ويجعل ما يقدمه يا رب في موازين حسنات وأصلا تبارك تعالى أن يكون خفيف عليكم الليلة من زي المرة اللي فاتت إن شاء الله uh, So the title for my presentation tonight is uh, I know uh, most of uh, if you are familiar with that term uh, but my role tonight is to uh, present you a practical approach for the undifferentiated shock. Uh, I have nothing to disclose tonight. Uh, why I'm here tonight with you, uh, uh, these are the objectives of my presentations. I have <clears throat> uh, some introductory slide about the, uh, I call it shock bitfolds. And this bit falls, most of us, uh, sometimes we miss it <clears throat> during the, uh, the resuscitation of shock patients. Second, uh, what are the common shock red flags before the patient develops shock? Three, uh, how can you evaluate uh, either bedside uh, with clinical tools or with uh, investigations, workup, how you evaluate the cause or the causes of shock? Uh, next, uh, I will present you a uh, few or some hemodynamic steps while you are managing uh, a patient with uh, undifferentiated shock or crashing patient with hypotension. Uh, then I will sum up with uh, some take home messages. <clears throat> so, for uh, I think for the next 45 minutes, it's uh, could be easy to, to present you the undifferentiated shock, and also it could be lengthy to present it in 45 minutes. So just to get the maximum benefit of uh, this presentation, so I uh, divided into two parts. So I just to avoid uh, to be lengthy, uh, to digest what I presented tonight. Uh, so <clears throat> I will have some, uh, time or some uh, slides uh, to present you some interactive uh, questions or case vignettes. So part one tonight, I will uh, highlight the shock pitfalls, uh, present you the shock red flags. I will give you uh, a summary uh, about how to evaluate the causes of shock then we will <clears throat> uh, present uh, one or two case vignettes and uh, a form of MCQs. What's remaining in part two? Uh, because I think Dr. Hassan, there was a uh, thought, uh, I don't know, it's still existing or under the process is to have a break during uh, mid year. Uh, Vacation, so um, I don't know. I'm all. Tala, did you talk about? So, uh, please, can you um uh, mute uh, yourself, please? <clears throat> for, uh, until Dr. Hassan, uh, he will decide uh, about part two. So I'm 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 ready to present. Inshallah, <laughs> Taala. Dr. Najla, please, uh, can you mute all the attendees, please? Dr. Najla? Dr. Najla? Dr. Najla, do you hear me after your 
هو صوته هو بالعرض هو لا اصل محمود اتصل وهو شغال اه يا دكتوره نجلاء يا جماعه فتح الميكروفون دكتوره نجلاء بما انك الهوست بليز كان يو كان يو ميوت اول ذا اتنديز كان يو كان يو ميوت اول ذا اتنديز بليز كله ميوت كله خلاص المفروض كله ميوت يا دكتور كله ميوت يا دكتور عادي اتفضل حضرتك اتفضل يا دكتور سامعيني كده؟ اوكي دكتور اجداء يو ميوتد مي ناو يو ام ميوتد مي صح؟ اوكي انا بس عشان اتفضل يا دكتور سو جاست فور ذا بيربس اور ذا سيك اوف تايم سو بارت 2 انتل دكتور حسن ان شاء الله تعالى هي ويل ديسايد وين اكزاكتلي وي كان بريزنتد ايزر ديورينج ذا ميد يير ليف اور سوري اور فيكيشن اور افتر ذا ميد يير فيكيشن Uh, so uh, I'm uh, at his <coughs> uh, order to present part two. What part two I will present? I will present the bedside shock evaluation. I will present you uh, POCUS protocols uh, role in undifferentiated shock to differentiate the undifferentiated. I will highlight uh, the role, how to choose dynamic versus static Uh, hemodynamic tool to solve the hemodynamic puzzle. Uh, we will answer the question through a simplified algorithm. How can you know that your patient uh, is fluid responsive or unresponsive? Then uh, we will highlight uh, some hemodynamic management tips. We will conclude with some take home messages. And as usual, we will present a few case vignettes in the form of MCQs. So just I will leave part two timing uh, for Dr. Hassan until he decides when can we present it, inshallah ta'ala, <clears throat> this month or uh, next. So let's to go with, uh, with part one. Uh, here, if you uh, uh, look for the shock, uh, whatever the type of the shock, usually the shock, if left, untreated or under-recognized, uh, it will progress to uh, a multi-organ dysfunction uh, because of the pathophysiology of shock. And uh, it will be the final pathway prior to mortality. So from where you are coming with the type of shock, uh, it will end up by a, he is in a shock state either cardiogenic, either obstructive, either distributive, if left under-recognized, if left untreated, eventually uh, it will lead to uh, uh, mortality. So uh, we have to, to know that the shock is, uh, as a shock state, is important. Why? Because it's, it's as I mentioned, it's generally a final, a final common pathway before mortality. Moreover, Most of the serious or critical illnesses uh, when you, you face a patient with shock are capable of causing shock. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, if left under-recognized or untreated, a late intervention, so eventually the shock will progress to multi-organ failure and uh, death. However, shock is often reversible. Uh, so, It's your role is to reverse the shock state, to identify the cause of shock. Is it single cause? Is it mixed? Is it overlapping? Is it multifactorial? Uh, so you can uh, prevent the cascade of multi-organ failure and the common pathway prior to mortality. So let's to move to uh, what are the common shock pitfalls. Uh, all of us, we should be aware, junior and seniors, We have to be aware that shock is about perfusion state, not blood pressure number. And this is very important. I have to stress in this more than one time. Shock is about perfusion, not the blood pressure. Second, you have always to assess 
the signs beside of adequate or inadequate perfusion, like the extremities, the urine output, the mental status. Why? Because at the end, we are clinician. We are not uh, a machine uh, guided uh, physician. Yes, it helps us, but before you use the machine, before you use the point of care, before you use the labs, you have to spend some time and to exhaust your clinical sense and clinical tools in the ER or if you are assessing patient in the ICU or on the ward res responding to rapid response team. And this is what I'm telling always for my resident or in the fellowship program. You have to recognize early, to smell early when the patient is uh, having an imminent critical illness, an imminent shock state, an imminent respiratory failure, unbending cardiac arrest. So it's your uh, uh, adequacy of uh, critical uh, care skills and uh, how to identify with your clinical skills before you use uh, uh, the other tools. Uh, and you have to know that there is no single sign, there is no single symptom, there is no single lab which is entirely sensitive for shock states. So it's a package, clinical, radiological, labs, point of care ultrasound, so you exhaust whatever you have in your pocket. But do not forget at the end, you are a clinician. So you are the wise man to choose which the appropriate tool in your hand. And as I mentioned, there is no single investigation also can exclude shock. You cannot rely only with your labs, with lactate, with uh, central venous saturation. So till now, we don't have single investigation. So I'm, I'm Again, I'm stressing nothing single. It's a package, so you have to uh, spend time with your clinical judgment, with your clinical assessment, then move to the next. Uh, sometimes we, we hear this from our uh, resident or our junior resident when I, I send him to assess patient or when he respond to a rapid response call, that he is telling me on the phone, doctor, uh, the patient, I saw him, his, his GCS or his mentation is well, and his GCS is 15 over 15. He's awake, responding to me. Uh, so uh, I assess him uh, overall. So uh, the patient cannot be in shock. Uh, moreover, another statement that they are saying, okay, I assess the patient. Everything is okay. I ordered lactate in the blood gas and it came at the serum like it is normal. So uh, this is exclude shock. Okay, I uh, address your statements, but excuse me, both statements are totally incorrect. Uh, patients in distributive shock may have normal blood pressure, particularly if they have a baseline hypertension or he is known to have a chronic hypertension. So uh, if you have patient with chronic hypertension, he came to you with, uh, uh, to you, it's a normal blood pressure, but still if the patient is showing a signs of hyperperfusion or the so-called, we call it occult shock or cryptogenic shock, the patient is showing you still his blood pressure to you is normal, but look for his pulse line. So this is again, uh, addressing the role of history taking. You should know that how is his pulse line uh, before coming to you? If the patient is an antihypertensive medication, non-hypertensive, what's his pulse line systolic if you have records in his file or by the history taking? What about the diagnostic algorithm? I know most of us, we admire the algorithms. We like the algorithms. But the diagnostic algorithms for the shock states, like any diagnostic algorithm for hypoxemia, for metabolic acidosis, for hyponatremia, for example, it works best among patients with single disease, process, who were previously normal. For example, patient with hyponatremia, he was totally normal, then he presented to you with hyponatremia. So if you have algorithm now to, this, to differentiate is it volemic? Is it hypervolemic? Is it hypovolemic? Because this is at the end, it's a single disease. Is it a symptomatic hyponatremia? So those algorithms uh, 
usually it worked uh, uh, for, 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 for single disease and patients were previously normal. But unfortunately, when you have patient with multifactorial or combined shock state on baseline or comorbid uh, patient, so the simple algorithm you like, eventually it will fail in uh, uh, these patients. Uh, I have to have uh, an, 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 an a statement important because we, we, uh, we face it many times, especially in patients with survivors of cardiac arrest, post trust or patients who develop STEMI or occlusive MI. Those usually when they develop uh, the MI or they develop or the cardiac arrest and they got resuscitated post trust they develop what we call post Trosc or sorry, post arrest or post MI, a type of distributive shock. Despite it's primarily cardiogenic, but here there is another type of shock, which is the distributive shock. Why? Because interest, interest, uh, interestingly, they found that those patients they who develop MI or uh, post cardiac arrest, they develop another type or combined type of shock, which is the distributive shock. Why? because of the cytokine uh, release syndrome or CRS plus the systemic inflammation and the pro-inflammatory markers. Here, another, it's not sepsis, it's a type of cytokine release syndrome. And we found this <clears throat> uh, very common in uh, COVID uh, patients. So sometimes the distributive type of shock uh, with its uh, hemodynamic variables may obscure the cardiogenic primary, primary source. So again, when you face patient in MI, with MI, he developed cardiogenic shock or post cardiac arrest and you have uh, a hemodynamic tool, think about that, that there is, it could be a mixed type of shock, which we call a distributive plus cardiogenic. For uh, critical care physicians, ER physicians, uh, people who cover the rapid response or critical care response team, we know that the most common cause of shock of unclear etiology or unidentified or uh, uh, un, uh, unknown reason is the septic shock. So on other causes for shock state, this is what we call it undifferentiated shock when you don't know exactly why the patient is in shock state. So other causes should be carefully excluded uh, prior to reach an empiric diagnosis of septic shock. Because uh, most of times when we, we face patient with a crashing patient in, with hypotension or with shock, so the first uh, thing for, for, for you in your mind, this is sepsis, but I, I agree with you, this is the most common cause if, for example, a patient is elderly, he came with urosepsis or he came with CAP, or uh, gallbladder, uh, or sorry, uh, uh, calcular cholecystitis, for example, or pancreatitis. So he, he present with a, a shock state. So you, you put a diagnosis primarily uh, as septic shock, especially if there is clinical stigmata uh, of uh, sepsis, like fever and chills, and I, uh, also some uh, clinical parameters we will highlight it later. But again, the most common of course of shock uh, of unknown or unclear etiology is septic shock. And again, uh, the other causes for shock should be excluded uh, and uh, you put the mind to exclude before reaching the empiric diagnosis of sepsis or septic shock. But when you are uncertain, and this is, happens frequently, whether the patient has sepsis or not, don't bother yourself because you are now in the era of undifferentiated shock. So concentrate on how sick the patient is because this is will lead you to intervene quickly. Uh, last but not the least, do not forget to evaluate the baseline or the archival data of the patient. Step down, be, sorry, step back and uh, ask yourself uh, history taking, Review the chart, review the old ECG. If this is, for example, uh, new MI or old cues. This is new bundle branch or old bundle branch. 
This is uh, go for the cultures. Did this patient have previous cultures, ESPL or MDROs? Review the echo. If this is new uh, tamponade, or a new pericardial effusion or something uh, from previous. Review ultrasound. Does the patient has bilonephritis from before? Does he have good stones? CT scans. So archival data, uh, either you have electronic or paperwork, you have to spend and to ask to review the data while you're assisting patients. So all, all uh, assessment go, as you can see, hand by hand. Clinical assessment, laboratory workup, investigation, research review in the data, and uh, first of all, also is the history taking. Uh, and why uh, it's important to evaluate the archival data uh, because this is, uh, it help you to sort out if any underlying chronic pathology uh, can help you to, do, to, to differentiate the undifferentiated shock. Okay, now we finished with the shock pitfalls. Let's to move to the shock red flag. So I, I, I like to call it a red flag. Why? Because it alerts you. Any red flag uh, uh, in, in, in critically ill patients, I like everyone, junior or senior, to be aware. There is uh, common red flags in ventilated patients. Uh, there is red flag in uh, hypotensive patients. There are red flags in COVID patients. There are red flags in uh, patients with AKI, for example. So uh, for, for shock state, we have certain red flags that it will alert you, it will tell you uh, that you can act preemptively, uh, preemptively, so uh, red flags is very important for this. Uh, we have in the shock, we have five red flags. So if I would like to, uh, uh, to come out from tonight with some take home messages and some important slides, this is one of the important slides for people who admire the clinical assessment, who people uh, admire the bedside. And I think uh, our, our uh, uh, mentor, our professor, Dr. Sharif Mukhtar, Dr. Hassan Khalid, I, I have to admit they are uh, one of the best uh, uh, professors and consultants in the critical care medicine who taught us and uh, who taught me personally, how can I spend time with patient before proceeding to echo or ultrasound. So I have to test my clinical judgment. I have to test my clinical assessment. And believe me, till now I'm here, I'm working in the critical care medicine for more than uh, 27 years now. And this lesson I did not forget. And when I came out to uh, teach my resident and my fellows, I am learning them, I am telling them, uh, Professor Dr. Sharif Mukhtar, Professor Dr. Hassan, Dr. Hamouda, and the, uh, the, the whole pillars of critical care department, Kerry University, they taught me uh, how can I spend time with uh, clinical assessment before asking for uh, uh, workup, especially if you have, if you are working in a place with limited resources or you are not experienced with uh, certain tools like focus or uh, other uh, imaging tool. So those are the five red flags uh, in the shock. We have hemodynamic red flags. We have a delirium uh, red flag, low urine output as red flag, skin perfusion as red flag, and capillary refill time uh, red flag. So those are the five. So again, if you want to come out with uh, take home messages. This is one of the important take home messages, the red flags in shock. Hemodynamics, delirium, low cardiac, uh, sorry, low urine output, skin perfusion, and capillary fill time. Let's to start with the first red flag <clears throat> regarding the hemodynamics. For the hemodynamics first, as I mentioned that uh, for shock, uh, all of us, we, we, we know by definition that it's hypotension. So I know that this is correct, but I have here to uh, highlight important things regarding the hypotension. First of all, trends will usually will be, be helpful than single abnormal leading. 
So respect the trends. Do not rely on one reading. Rely on the trend. How is the trend of the readings? This is not only for blood pressure, not only for hypertension. And this golden rule is to respect and to follow the trends if you are relying, for example, on CVB measurement for, for trend, cardiac output measurement for trends, uh, white count, uh, leukocytosis, leukopenia for trends, for hemodynamic variables, look for the trends. So uh, if you are uh, assessing ventilator graphs, look for the trends. Usually do not rely on single value or single abnormal value. Wait for next, repeat yourself, repeat another test if your test is repeatable. So again, respect the trends and rely on the trends. Do not rely on single abnormal value. Next, our second, hypotension, yes, is the most common sign of shock, but is not always the first sign. So again, do not wait until the patient is hypotensive. This is why we are relying or we are alerting you with the red flags. Yes, I agree with you. Hypotension is the most common sign of shock, but remember is not always the first sign. So what's the definition of hypotension? And this is one of the Viva or OSCE common questions for our fellows. And sometimes some people, they are not uh, fully answering us. Uh, with the correct answer. So hypotension by definition, uh, we have uh, those three definitions. So when I ask you, what's the definition of hypotension? You have to tell me it's uh, systolic blood pressure less than 90. Or, or this is very important, or systolic blood pressure drop more or equal uh, to 40 millimeter mercury from baseline. So this is very important for people with chronic hypertension. So any drop, from the baseline, how can you know? From history taking. So equal or more than 40 millimeter mercury from the baseline is hypotension. For example, if patient is accustomed for systolic of 170 or 180, he has chronic hypertension or chronic systolic hypertension, and he's accustomed to this, then he came to you with systolic of 120 and he's dizzy, uh, he's febrile, he is hypotensive despite that his systolic is 110 because there is a drop significant more than 40 millimeter mercury from his baseline. Third definition, according to the survivor, uh, surviving sepsis campaign for sepsis and septic shock uh, for hypotension that necessitate fluids resuscitation or initiation of pressures is the mean arterial blood pressure less than 65. And this is the target uh, for surviving sepsis campaign to resuscitate fluid to, to initiate the vasopressors and to maintain MAP equal or more than 65. So this is regarding the definition. For patient with chronic hypertension and uh, decline in the urine output, consider a higher MAP. Why? Because those patients, they are familiar with, or sorry, accustomed to higher perfusion pressure for their kidneys or for the organ blood flow. Uh, and your aim is to maintain more 80 or more for people who are non-hypertensive, not 65 like the surviving sepsis campaign is telling you, your aim to maintain higher MAP is to shift the organ, or what you call it the organ's autoregulatory uh, curve or range to the right. So to increase the, the renal perfusion pressure or the cerebral perfusion pressure. Second aim is to avoid the development of EKI, and they found that when you maintain higher MAP, you reduce the development of EKI, you reduce the need for renal replacement therapy, either CRRT or intermittent hemodialysis. And I have to stress on, again, one size MAP does not fit all, as I mentioned. Surviving sepsis campaign telling you the target MAP is 65 and above. If this is fits to all people, no. This, uh, this statement, as I told you, uh, does not fit for patients with chronic hypertension. And you can try it for people who are hypertensive and coming to you with septic shock. You target 65 or above while they are accustomed or they have their own higher map from before like 90 or 80, then when you do vasopressor challenge, 65, and they're why you are adding pressures while well, his map is 65 or 67, because this patient 
he is accustomed to have higher maps. So I do what's called vasopressor challenge. So you found that the patient is responding uh, in the form of good perfusion and uh, adequate uh, urine output. And this is what uh, I told you before. This is uh, how to, uh, to uh, respect the individual uh, maps. Here is the autoregulatory curve. So if you are reducing the map lower down, below 65, you are in increasing the risk of hypoperfusion, but not too much above, because sometimes if you increase the higher map in people who are not hypertensive, so you are on the upper edge with the excessive vasoconstriction because of the impaired microcirculation. And this is why when they did the studies and the surviving sepsis campaign, they choose 65, not 70, not 80 in normal intensive patient because they did not found any benefit from getting higher MAP uh, 70 or 80 on normal intensive patient. So uh, in, in hypertensive patient or chronic hypertensive, yes, we are targeting higher MAP 8 or above to shift the autoregulatory curve to the right, but for normal intensive, 65 uh, or more is adequate, but do not go higher because a risk of excessive vasoconstriction and impairment in the microbial circulation. And again, you have to be individualized uh, for your patient because you are the bedside. Uh, and this is also will tell you uh, when to go high, when to go uh, low. Uh, and as I told you, you have to remember that one size does not fit all. <clears throat> Uh, what about the shock index? Uh, I, I know most of you who are working uh, or having a background of anesthesia, maybe they are familiar with the shock index. And this is one of the, of the common questions in the OSCE or the VIVA when we ask the candidates uh, during the scenario, uh, how can you calculate the shock index and what's its importance? So it's one of the common questions during the VIVA or OSCE exams. Shock index is a useful, simple, bit side quick tool to understand the tachycardia in the context of uh, blood pressure is normal tension and uh, normal tensive or hypotensive patients. So again, it's a bit side, quick tool, two variables only, very simple. And this is will tell you how can I identify by shock index uh, and uh, the, in, in the role of, of shock or shock assessment or preemptive uh, smelling that shock is cooking. So uh, the shock index is very simple, is the heart rate divided by systolic pressure. Two readings from bit sign, even if it's non-invasive or you have invasive monitoring. You are in the ER, you are in the bedside, even you are out of the hospital. So shock index, <clears throat> but we are applying this usually in the, in the, in the ICU, oh, sorry, in hospital, in, in hospital settings. Uh, we got the heart rate divided by systolic blood pressure. What's the normal SI or what's the normal shock index? The normal shock index is less than 0.7. They found that if the shock index more than one, more than one, so patient's tachycardic and is hypotensive, so if the shock index is more than one, it's they found it, it's a more specific predictor for hyperlactitemia. So when you ask for, or you sorry, calculate the shock index and you found it more than one, 1.52. So uh, when you request the blood gas, you will find that the patient has significant hyperlactitemia more than two. Uh, plus, or moreover, also it's a, a specific predictor, predictor of the 28 uh, days mortality in, in critically ill patients. So this is how important a tool and very simple, dividing the heart rate by systolic PP, uh, if you calculate it more than one, this is a specific predictor of hyperlactitemia uh, and also mortality. So you have to be preemptive. Not only this, for rapid sequence intubation, for uh, if you are intubating patients with rapid sequence technique, when you calculate the uh, shock, uh, sorry, the shock index, and you found it more than 0.8, this is, we call it a predictor of post-intubation crash and hypotension. So you have to be ready with the resuscitation tools 
in in your hands bedside you have the epinephrine the ephedrine the dopamine the levofed everything with you bedside in your in your hand because you predicted the what we call post intubation crash because the, uh, the 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 shock index is more than 0.8 so uh, just to summarize uh, what's the rule of shock index so we call it a, a secondary or triage tool especially in mass casualty uh, when we have uh, critical care bed surge we don't have the the the, the during the covid we don't have uh, the luxury for assessing lactate and for assessing um, uh, or, or with point of care ultrasound, for example, or we are assessing crashing patients. So we rely on those very uh, simple uh, tools like the shock index. Uh, so uh, in, in also in casualties and trauma patients. So it's very important to uh, uh, know and to familiarize yourself with this very uh, simple uh, tool. Uh, so it's tool again in crashing patient for uh, post intracal intubation, uh, especially when you use rapid sequence. Second, when you suspect patient with sepsis, it has a specific uh, uh, rule and predictor. They found now it has a rule not only on general shock and also hemorrhagic shock. So it has two specific predictors for uh, sepsis and hemorrhage or uh, distributive and hemorrhagic shock. This is the shock index. Uh, next uh, item for the hemodynamics is the bradycardia. Uh, of course, we talk about the hypotension, the shock index. Now we have to talk about the bradycardia. All of us, we know that the cardiac output is directly proportional to the heart rate. Severe bradycardia, heart rate below 45 or below 40, it should uh, alert you uh, or raise your concern that the patient may have signs of hyperperfusion. And I will explain to you later how uh, the, the heart rate or the, sorry, the bradycardia uh, can, uh, uh, can be put in the stigmata of impending shock. Even if the blood pressure is maintained by compensatory mechanisms of the systemic vasoconstriction, again, the cardiac output and the perfusion is still poor. So do not be fooled by the normal blood pressure, but if you look carefully, deeply, digging behind the perfusion signs and the cardiac output, you will find those are significantly reduced, despite that the patient is still initially having a blood pressure with uh, normal blood pressure with bradycardia. And uh, as I told you, do not be fooled with normal uh, blood pressure bradycardia, because here is the uh, illustration of the uh, cardiac output. As all we know that the cardiac output is the heart rate equals the heart rate multiplied by stroke volume. Initially, if the heart rate is reduced, there is a compensatory mechanism that was increasing the, uh, the stroke volume. But within certain limits now, if the heart rate is getting um, more and more low, severe bradycardia, still the stroke volume is limited, the heart rate is bradycardic, so is more bradycardic. So here the cardiac output is getting more and more reduced. Despite that, you may have a still normal blood pressure because of the compensatory mechanisms. And here is the compensatory mechanisms that can maintain the blood pressure. This is, uh, I know all of you, the, you are aware about it, that the blood pressure, this is from physiology, that the blood pressure uh, equals the cardiac output multiplied by the SVR or systemic vascular resistance. So if you have a reduced cardiac output, this is the role of the compensatory mechanism to maintain the blood pressure. So here in front of your eyes, you have normal PP or normal blood pressure, but the cardiac output is reduced and this maintains normal blood pressure by the effect of the compensatory mechanism. So once you get more and more uh, 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 a reduction in the cardiac output, uh, the, 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 there is a, a limited role for your systemic vascular resistance so this is, uh, again, uh, it's a compensatory mechanism, have a limited role to maintain your blood pressure. Uh, the uh, next red flag is the delirium or impaired mentation or mental status. Uh, the new onset delirium, hypoactive or mixed type of delirium can be a sign of shock, but it's neither sensitive nor specific. So do not rely only on delirium, but if it is a new onset, with other stigmata, uh, as we talk like the red flags, other uh, skin perfusions, 
and in other red flags, so put it in your mind. But remember, it's neither specific nor sensitive uh, because there is many causes underlie the, uh, the delirium. What about the uh, next red flag is the low urine output. The urine output uh, representing a renal hyperperfusion so if you have adequate urine output, so you are now with the clinical assessment uh, that are maintaining urine output with between uh, more than 0.5 to 1 ml per kg per hour. But if the urine output drop to less than 0.5 per kg per hour, this is something worrisome for renal hyperperfusion. You have to be alerted now that there is a renal hyperperfusion. And remember the decline in the urine output is uh, or and the AKI is one of the early events in the progression of sepsis. And I think I highlighted this in the previous uh, presentation when I presented to you the AKI. Uh, half of patient with septic shock, they found that they develop AKI and decline of urine output before uh, rising the renal function test when they present uh, before their presentation to the AR. Now they are considering the AKI maybe an, an early sign or a red flag alerting, the, alerting to uh, the presence of sepsis. And also I told you uh, before that it may be one of the red flags coming up for uh, sepsis scoring system or sepsis assessment. Uh, what about the, the, the skin perfusion red flag? We talked about hemodynamics, delirium, low urine output. What about the skin perfusion? Skin perfusion in the degree of coldness or warmth of modeling of the skin. So for cold extremities or cold extremities, we are considering those are early signs of peripheral vasoconstriction as a compensatory mechanism with reduced cardiac output. If all extremities are cold, this more specific for hypoperfusion than single arm uh, or single extremity. So if you have the four limbs, Cold, this is more specific for hypoperfusion. What about the skin modeling? The skin modeling here is less sensitive, but more specific for hypoperfusion. And when you have a skin modeling, it carries a high mortality. So you have to have a red flag in your mind that my patient have a skin modeling indicating that there is ongoing hypoperfusion. And there is a modeling score, we, we call it a modeling score for severity assessment. If you hear like this diagram, if it's confined to the, around the knee, because this is a large area, you can see the modeling. So around the knee, the small spot, this is a grade one, wider, still limited to the knee. So this is uh, score two, three is above the knee, uh, four going to the mid side or higher, five up to the groin. So this is like this picture. So uh, the severity of uh, modeling uh, increases with the hypoperfusion. So I should not wait until I have uh, score five. I should uh, uh, preemptively intervene when I have stage one or stage two. And here uh, the study is the role of skin temperature to identify the clinical hypoperfusion in critically ill patients. So the uh, address the role of uh, skin uh, uh, temperature, warm or cold, uh, at similar variable, at similar heart rate, pressure, uh, hemoglobin oxygenation, uh, so oxygen delivery uh, variables are maintained. So they found that for the cardiac index, uh, pH, central venous circulation, uh, compared to uh, the coldness, or uh, when you compare the cold or warm, uh, shock state. So those are uh, important variables when you rely on the skin temperature to identify the clinical hypoperfusion. Moreover, the, uh, the uh, study uh, in 2019, uh, 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 an interesting uh, point regarding the effect of resuscitation strategy to target the peripheral perfusion status versus serum lactate. Now serum lactate, you measure it, either serum or through the blood gas, arterial or venous, and what's the, the, the targets or the strategy to target the skin perfusion versus high lactate and their effect on the 28 uh, day mortality among patients in septic shock. And this is, was the conclusion. The, uh, it was a randomized uh, control trial 
in patient, adult patient with septic shock, and they found that the use of peripheral uh, perfusion targeted resuscitation, one of the target or endpoint resuscitation compared to the serum lactate did not significantly reduce the mortality. Uh, last but not the least in the red flags is the capillary refill time or CRP. Again, it's one of the clinical uh, skills beside. So the capillary refill time changes during the shock resuscitation. We found that those changes of the capillary refill time significantly associated with grave prognosis. So what's the, the capillary refill time? It's measuring the capillary refill time in the index finger and at the knee. And they found that if the, uh, the index finger capillary refill time equal or more than 2.4 seconds, at the knee, uh, the capillary refill time more than 4.9, just for simplification, 2.5 and 5 seconds. If 2.5 or more at the index, five or more seconds at the knee, both are strong predictive factors for 14 days mortality in critical ill patients. So you can know how uh, this capillary fill time, it's a simple tool bedside, you can rely on assessment as a red flag in shock. And uh, all of us, we know that the normal capillary fill time is less than two seconds. If more than 2.5, 2.5 or more, at the index, so do not measure it only at one side, use at the end to increase the sensitivity. So uh, measured at the index, measured at the knee. And uh, again, <clears throat> uh, as I told you, the positive predictive values for a all tests usually it increases if you use more signs uh, to put all puzzle together, clinical, skin perfusion, red flags, and uh, uh, other uh, interventions or other diagnostic tools. So uh, uh, the third part, I think I have a few minutes to uh, finish my, my talk tonight. Uh, uh, the role of you as intensivist to evaluate the underlying cause of underlying causes of shock. So uh, this is your role because now we have patient where he was, uh, sorry, has undifferentiated shock. So uh, welcome to uh, the room uh, with a patient who is crashing and he's hypotensive and you don't know uh, what's the, the etiology or what's the clear source of uh, hypotension. So to evaluate the underlying cause of shock, a crashing patient, as I told you, this is the most valuable player in your game. Because if you identify the source, either single or combined, of course, your management will be directed uh, correctly. If you miss, for example, this is uh, obstructive shock and you are directed to sepsis or something different. If you miss hypovolemic and you are directed to uh, obstructive, you will miss and you will lose the game. And remember, uh, less is more. What does it mean less is more? Uh, less is more, it's uh, now a paradigm shift in the critical care, not only in resuscitation, but for GI bleed, for mechanical ventilation. And I have, inshallah ta'ala, a very interesting talk I presented before. I can present it uh, one day more, inshallah ta'ala, in your general club. Uh, entitled less, and more, less is more in critical, uh, critically ill patient. What does it mean less is more in critically ill patient? How can you add benefit with less is more? So when you face patient with um, uh, undifferentiated shock, be pertinent, be wise, and remember less is more, do not add harm, add benefit with the tools that you have starting from history taking, ending up by uh, laboratory and imaging techniques. Uh, and when you face patient with uh, undifferentiated shock, uh, you are blind, like this man who is blind and facing the elephant, so he will be elusive. So if you are alerting yourself with the possible causes from history taking, from clinical judgment, for sure you will not be elusive, at least you have 50% of the clinical assessment and the red flags, so you will not be elusive. Uh, next step, you will be pertinent to how to uh, tailor your uh, investigation to reach the proper diagnosis. 
So your rule, like Dr. House, is to differentiate the undifferentiated shock. We have many types of shock. So your rule is to differentiate the undifferentiated. Uh, so uh, why shock? Why undifferentiated? I, I know all of you, you know the definition of shock. But again, it's just a reminder that it's a state of cellular uh, or tissue hypoxia due to reduced oxygen delivery and or increased oxygen consumption uh, and this leads to inadequate oxygen utilization. Uh, as I told you, this is the most commonly occurs when there is a circulatory failure and this circulatory failure, it manifests as hypoperfusion or tissue hypoperfusion. What's the definition of undifferentiated shock? When we tell you this patient has undifferentiated shock, it refers that the uh, situation where the shock is recognized, you know that the patient is shocked now with their clinical assessment, with the red flags, with your clinical uh, tests, with skin perfusion, with all clinical signs of hyperfusion, so the patient with hypotension, whatever, so the patient now recognized as he having a shock state, but the cause is unclear or unidentified, so we call it undifferentiated shock. So uh, uh, these are the, the four uh, common types of undifferentiated shock, the hypovolemic shock, the cardiogenic shock, the obstructive shock, and the distributive shock. Under each entity of those, uh, these four uh, main categories of shock, either hypovolemic or cardiogenic or obstructive or distributive, you have to familiarize with yourself what's the broad differential diagnosis. For example, if hypovolemic is the patient having hemorrhage or excellent Unmute Adil, Yanagla, Adil muted Lee. Nagla, unmute Adil, Adil, I felt Ali Lee. Oh, I wonder if I felt my option host or I mean host. So, so for it's okay, I'm muted now, Dr. Hassan Shukri. Thank you. So, for hypovolemic, you have to broaden your differential diagnosis, not only the bleeding, it could be GI losses post-operative, third spacing losses, capillary leak syndrome, dehydration. So broaden your, your, your differential for hypovolemic. For cardiogenic, it could be post-MI, like STEMI or what's called it, occlusive MI, could be uh, myopericarditis, uh, could be arrhythmogenic cardiogenic shock, could be cytokine release syndrome, could be uh, Takutsobo syndrome, what you call it, stress-induced cardiomyopathy. For obstructive shock, familiarize with the common types under or categories under obstructive shock, uh, high risk PE or the previously known as massive PE, cardiac tamponade, acute core pulmonal or tension nemo. For distributive shock, familiarize with the most common, which is the sepsis, adrenal crisis, post cardiac arrest. Uh, as I told you, this is related to the cytokine release syndrome and uh, systemic inflammation, anaphylactic shock, and of course, neurogenic shock due to CNS catastrophe. Those are the four types. Moreover, I will add for you another two types. The one, what we call it post-intubation crash or post-intubation hypotension. And this is commonly we face it in uh, uh, mechanically ventilated patients when we intubate them. Either we have rapid sequence intubation or we have elective intubation, probably because the patient is basically is dehydrated or this is related to the peak effect you apply or because of the use of the sedative you use, either propofol or uh, midazolam you use. One type, which is the mixed type of shock. So now you have four and you have another two, put it in your mind to widen your differential diagnosis. Uh, mixed type of shock, not as isolated, plus the post intubation hypotension. What about the epidemiology uh, for the undifferentiated shock and incidence? The distributive shock, uh, mainly septic, it represents, as I told you before, uh, the most common cause, about 60-62% of uh, the distributive shock to sepsis is about 62%. While distributive shock to uh, other causes rather than sepsis like adrenal crisis or cytokine release or neurogenic is uh, 4%. Cardiogenic shock, it represents 16%. Equivalent to the hypovolemic shock is also 16%. Obstructive shock is 2%. So among the undifferentiated shock, remember that the distributive type of shock due to septic shock is the commonest type. Next is cardiogenic and hypovolemic. 
then uh, the non uh, uh, septic distributive shock, then the obstructive shock. The overlap syndrome, or the so called combined, does it exist or in isolation? Yes, patient with cardiogenic shock, post cardiac arrest syndrome, or massive bleed may also, as I told you, they have combined type or other type of shock, distributive shock due to systemic inflammation or uh, cytokine release syndrome and vasoplegia. So he will have conf not conflicted, confusing the hemodynamic variables. So you have to be aware about the overlap syndrome or mixed type of shock, we call it. About 50% of patients with septic shock, they develop sepsis-related cardiomyopathy or cardiac dysfunction induced by sepsis. So again, you may have uh, cardiogenic plus distributive type of shock. Patient with hypotension and they have severe or advanced heart failure, they may be, in fact, volume uh, responsive because they are depleted because of the overdiuresis. He has cardiogenic, but at the same time, because of the overdiuresis, he's hypovolemic, especially if the patient has uh, overdiuresis or GI losses like diarrhea or occult bleeding. Uh, until here, I have to just uh, finish my uh, uh, presentation tonight, part two. Uh, if you have uh, some time with me, uh, with me and you are still awake, just uh, two case vignettes. This is the first case I need volunteer uh, to answer the, the first case. This uh, in the morning round, you are presented with the following data obtained from hypotensive patients. The map is 60 millimeter mercury. The uh, uh, mean arterial blood pressure uh, is uh, six. They have systemic uh, vascular resistance, 407, 407. The cardiac output was 4.5 liter per minute. So those are the, the hemodynamic data you got it. The map is 60. The mean right atrial pressure is six. The SVR is 407. A cardiac output is 4.5. The question is, what's the most accurate interpretation of these data and why? First choice, Abdurrahman. septic shock. Second choice, anaphylactic shock. Third, hemorrhagic shock. The, the data is uninterpretable. Um, Abdurrahman, yalla, uh, think it is um, septic shock. <clears throat> um, Why septic shock? Sorry. Can you justify uh, your answer? Uh, decreased systemic vascular resistance and increased uh, cardiac output. It's high, high cardiac output uh, shock. Why not anaphylactic? Um, I think anaphylactic will be uh, with um, decreased cardiac output also and distributed yeah, and decreased. Yeah, <laughs> Any other thoughts? Any other answers than Dr. Abdul Rahman? Data, Muhammad, we all data is uninterpretable. So, Dr. Muhammad, he chose the answer. Why, Dr. Muhammad? Can you unmute yourself and answer why you choose D? I think دي لان هنا السيستميك فاسكولار ريزيستنس عاليه فدي اجينست السبتك والانفلكتيك شوك في الهايبوفيلاميك شوك المفروض كارديك اوتبوت هيبقى قليل اما هنا احنا عندنا الكارديك اوتبوت عالي والسيستميك فاسكولار ريزيستنس برضو عاليه كده السيستميك فاسكولار ريزيستنس عاليه الاس بي ار 407 عاليه واتس ذا نورمال سيستميك فاسكولار ريزيستنس Okay, sorry, sorry. So your answer is still D? Dr. 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 Because we have another another uh, case vignette. Mm -hmm. We have two answers. One answer from our colleague, Dr. Abdul Rahman, and one from Dr. Muhammad. One he answered septic uh, A, and Dr. Uh, uh, Muhammad he answered D, and he chose the data was uh, uninterpretable in his opinion, but he did not convince me with the rationale. Uh, 
Uh, the correct answer is D. Yes, but for very simple uh, answer, the equation from physiology, if you remember, the systemic vascular resistance, the SVR, equals what? Equals MAP minus CVB divided by cardiac output multiplied by 80. So now when he, he, uh, he told me the equation here, so I need someone if you can compute the data based on this equation. So now I am testing he is, is the question, this question is very is tricky because he's testing your background of measurements. So each data you got it from the monitor, you have to stop and uh, correlate and think how is it accurate. Now this is, this data, it's invasive data. It came from Swan Gans, for example. Why? Because he, or non-invasive, uh, like uh, Vigilio or uh, Biko. He measured for you the SVR and the cardiac output. So you have now the map, you have the CVB or the mean arterial uh, atrial pressure, right, atrial pressure, and SVR is 4.7 and cardiac output. So we were just uh, tricking you because you said it's septic and flat, okay. But I have to calculate according to this equation, the SVR. So the SVR is map minus CVB divided by cardiac output, it will multiply by 80. So Dr. Mohammed, can you, because you chose D, can you, can you calculate this SVR based on this equation? Dr. Mohammed, can you do it? I'll do it. is 60. Minus CVB is 6. How much? Uh, 56, 54 uh, on the cardiac 54 output. divided by cardiac output, which is the uh, cardiac output 4.5. Then a uh, drop of 80. 54 divided by 4.5. Then the uh, house of the drop of 80. 96. 900. 900. Allah so it's uh, it's 900. So here is يبقى uh, معنى كده ال 400 دي is unpredictable غلط بناء على الداتا اللي أنت أعطيتها لي أيها المونيتور الداتا اللي أنت أعطيتها لي دي غلط لأن ال SVR لما أنا حسبته ماب ماينس CVB على كارد كود مطلعت by uh, 80 المفروض يطلع 900 and above which is normal. So this is uh, an interpreted data. I have to repeat the data again. تمام؟ the same, the same like if you are looking for the monitor ولقيت the heart rate على المونيتور is 160 والنيرس she called you doctor the heart rate is 160 then you came in hurry you saw that the monitor is counting double counting because of the are increasing the sensitivity of the signals on the monitor lead so the monitor is counting the T wave and the R wave so heart rate of what basically is 80 you saw the heart rate is not tachycardia the patient is talking to you no tachycardia but the rate on the monitor is 160 because of false data, data and unpredictable. This is not like a card because of double rate counting. The same is here. Mashallah, Dr. Muhammad, you got it? Tamim. Tamim. So this is basic physiology. Remember, systemic vascular resistance is MAP minus CVB divided by cardiac output multiplied by 80, and the normal SVR 700 to 1500 dials per second per uh, centimeter to the root of minus five. Uh, the second and the last case vignette tonight, I have a 58-year-old man with necrotizing goldstone pancreatitis with acute respiratory failure who developed fever and hypotension. Prior to hospitalization, he, ha he has been healthy, having only hypercholesterolemia as a medical illness. Now he is receiving mechanical ventilation with post-pressure support, tidal volume for, for, uh, sorry, 8 ml per kg of the predicted body weight, the respiratory rate preset at 14 with beep of eight centimeter water. He is on vasopressor pressure support norepinephrine, 25 microgram per minute, and he is receiving maintenance IV fluid lactated ringer 75 ml per hour. His cardiac rhythm and the arterial blood pressure uh, through the radial arterial uh, line uh, is displayed with the next slide. They measured the abdominal pressure through the bladder pressure and it was normal, but the patient is allegoric. He is deeply sedated and breathing passively. 
So he is synchronized with the ventilator. They requested a laboratory workup that resulted in a remarkable figures of the serum lactate was five millimole per liter. The creatinine was 1.8 and the hemoglobin concentration was 7.8. Just I will leave this 10 seconds just to have a look on the scenario before I move to the figure, then the, the, the question. So this is the figure. This is the monitor. And this is the arterial line waveform. Just I will leave this also for five seconds just to review. So again, here, this is the, the, the scenario. Here is the figure tracing. And here is the question. According to the scenario, according to the figure, which of the following interventions is the most appropriate at this time? And B, uh, cautious when you have an NCQ and they are telling you the most appropriate. You may find in your choice or your answer more than one is correct, but he's, he's asking you what's the most appropriate. So it's very important. This is one of the, the questions that when we learn our resident and fellows uh, with the MCQ, just be careful with when the state in the MCQ was the most important. You may have one or two correct but not the most important. So first, or A, rapid infusion of lactate fluid bolus. B, so transfuse back the RBCs. C is to increase the norepinephrine infusion to target map of 85 millimeter mercury. D, nothing to do and to continue the current therapy. Any volunteer to answer me? Dr. Dr. Mohammed, Dr. Dr. Abdel Naim. Amen. A, rapid infusion of lactate stringer. Min Maya? Mohammed. Dr. Mohammed, uh, why can you rationalize your, your answer? Because in the arterial line, there is a pulse pressure variation. It is clear that the eye is fluid, fluid responsive. The eye is not going to be able to get the eye. We are going to be able to get the septic shock. ما فيش رول للهيموجلوبين هنا ان انا ادي هيموجلوبين يعني فمش عامل ترانسفيوجن ان انا ان انا الاجابه السي ان انا ادي نور ابنفرين هيبقى الاول ان انا ادي فلود الاول وبعد كده ابقى ادي انتروبس ثاني حاجه التارجت ماب بتاعي مش هيبقى 85 لان انا مش مدي هيستوري ان هو كرونيك هايبرتنشن تمام Excellent, Dr. Mohammed. I'm very glad for your correct answer. Excellent. Uh, this is how, how the intensive scar interpret the data on the monitor and the data to give it. So Dr. Mohammed, he read carefully the scenario. Then he found that the patient had hypovolemic or septic shock. And he looked for the monitor and he noticed that the patient is tachycardic. But when he looked for the red tracing, so which is the arterial uh, line waveform, he found that the so-called, there is pulse pressure variation. There is wide pulse pressure variation with the inspiration. And uh, Dr. Mohammed, he chose the correct answer, which is the yes. He will infuse uh, more fluids. No need for uh, the transfusion of back RBCs because the volume is above seven in critical patients accepted. MAP, as he mentioned, is uh, more than 65. So no need to uh, increase the MAP to more than 85. Especially, as he mentioned, nothing to uh, given as a, the patient is chronic hypertension, especially he's allegoric, and the lactate is high. And D is also a, correct, uh, a wrong answer because the patient is hypotensive, developing EKI, high lactate, I will not just stay watching. So uh, this is uh, a very good example how we interpret the arterial waveform with the so-called the pulse pressure variation or BB variation or stroke volume variation. And the pulse pressure variation, it represents an important interaction between lungs and heart. Why? If the patient is ventilated, either spontaneous, uh, sorry, uh, 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 during the ventilation, inspiration and expiration, uh, this alters or affect the intrathoracic pressure and uh, it causes wide variation of the stroke volume. 
So either spontaneous or during mechanical ventilation, the inspiration expiration, it variates the on-trust respiration, as you know, and this affects the stroke volume. So there is a greater variability or variation in the stroke volume. Uh, this is represented by increased pulse pressure variation in shock patients or volume depleted or volume responsiveness. So if you have a greater variability of the pulse pressure or the stroke volume, so high or increased SVV, stroke volume variation, or pulse pressure variation from the arterial line will form. Uh, this is represent, as Dr. Mohammed uh, uh, mentioned, the patient is fluid responsiveness. And I will, inshallah ta'ala, explain in part two uh, through, under the title of uh, the question, is my patient is fluid responsive or not? And how can you judge? So simply the equation is the pulse pressure variation you uh, measure the, uh, the maximum pulse pressure minus the minimum pulse pressure divided by the mean if the calculation more than 12%. So this is suggestive that the patient is fluid responsive and you have to start fluid challenge as Dr. Mohammed said. But to enter breadth, the pulse pressure variation, Dr. Mohammed said that before you enter breadth, وتحسب الكالكوليشن دي لازم هذا المريض يكون عنده ثلاث اشياء مهمه ثلاثه كونديشن لازم يتحققها فيرست اوف اول بيشنت شود بي ان ساينس ريزم عشان يكون عندك كونسيستنت فيلينج تايم ما يكونش المريض عنده اريزمياس اور اي فاب اور في تاك اور اكسترا سيستول لازم يكون عند المريض ان ساينس ريزم ايفن اف ساينس كارد عشان يكون عندك كونسيستنت فيلينج تايم Second patient, uh, I cannot rely on pulse pressure variation for a patient who have spontaneous uh, uh, breathing. I rely mainly on patients who are mechanically ventilated, مش بس كده. ما يكونش عنده spontaneous breathing. يعني لازم يكون بيأخد تايدل فوليوم 8 cc per kg of uh, predicted uh, body, uh, body weight. And this is to be consistent with the effect of the ventilator, to nullify the effect of the ventilator. Uh, and I will tell you uh, how, inshallah, in the part two, how can I use the pulse pressure variation in uh, ARD station while we are ventilating with four to six ml, not with eight. So how can we do it? So the patient, uh, second condition should be uh, ventilated, not spontaneously breathing. Uh, uh, tidal volume should be eight cc per kg. Also, the patient should not have an open chest or heart lung, uh, uh, sorry, an open sternotomy like post-operative cardiac surgery. So those are the, the three conditions to uh, interpret the pulse pressure variation. The value is more higher than 12%, patient is fluid responsive. Less than uh, 12 or 10% less, patient is not fluid responsive, do not uh, get fluids. And this is a very simple tool. How sensitive is specific? Sensitivity and specificity of the pulse pressure variation from reading the arterial uh, waveform and the calculation is reaching 90%. So it's a good sensitivity and specificity. This is how you calculate. This is the, the thick bar. Here it, it illustrates the maximum pulse pressure. Here the, uh, the thin bar, here it calculates the, so the, this is the, 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 the variation of uh, the maximum, you get the maximum and the monitor you get and through the cursor here, you use the cursor of the monitor from uh, the maximum one, it will tell you the maximum BB, then you'll go to the minimum with the cursor, it will give you the minimum, then at the end, it will give you the mean. So this is the maximum, the minimum, the mean, you divide uh, the equation, maximum minus mean and minus minimum divided by uh, mean, it, if it is more than 12, so this is fluid responsive, give fluid. If less than 12 uh, patients are responsive. Uh, sorry. Thank you, Mr. Qayyim. I just want to 